new ministerial appointments for Bougainville Affairs and Tourism. The Pacific Marine Industrial Zone to start after long delay. And Manam Islanders call for inclusion in the resettlement process. This is National MTV News with Lorraine Genia. Good evening and thank you for joining us. This is Friday's News. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill today announced the appointment of Bougainville Regional MP Joe Lehrer as Bougainville Minister and Kundiawa Gembog MP Tobias Kulang as Tourism, Arts and Culture Minister. These ministerial portfolios were in the care of Prime Minister and Sport Minister Justin Chichenko respectively before today's appointments. Both MPs were sworn in as state ministers by Governor-General Grand Chief Sir Michael Ogio at the Government House today. Their appointment follows the recent death of former Bougainville Affairs Minister, the late Stephen Kama, and the national court case involving the former Tourism, Arts and Culture Minister, Boka Kondra. Both seats were vacant for over six weeks and were overseen by the Prime Minister and the Minister for Sports, Justin Chichenko. I welcome the appointment of uh, the two new ministers, uh, especially uh, uh, Minister uh, Tobias Kulang, uh, member for Kundiawa. Uh, he will take over the responsibility of uh, tourism, culture and arts. Uh, we also welcome uh, uh, Minister Joe Lera, who is uh, the regional member for Bougainville and as, as he will be looking after the Ministry of Bougainville Affairs. The new Bougainville Affairs Minister is a member of the United Resource Party, while Minister Kulan is from the People's Progress Party. Both are coalition partners to the ruling People's National Congress Party. So we will, uh, look uh, very closely to working with him and his party, the United Resource Party, who are our major coalition partner in, in our government. And uh, we are, uh, of course, uh, that ministry was held by that party in, 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 the, in, in, uh, in the beginning of our term of uh, government in 2012, and we are just fulfilling uh, our responsibility uh, going forward. The ceremony was witnessed by other state ministers, including Planning and Monitoring Minister Charles Abel and United Resource Party leader William Duma. Tekla Gunga, National MTV News. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill has directed the new Bougainville Affairs Minister, Joe Lira, to facilitate the joint supervisory body meeting that has been deferred twice since December last year. This is the new minister's first task and priority, and the Prime Minister wants a date set on this important meeting between the national and autonomous Bougainville government. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill says more dialogue between both parties are vital and crucial to discuss the way forward for Bougainville's referendum. And the Joint Supervisory Board in Bithing is the avenue where issues seeking solutions are discussed. We have uh, already discussed that with the new minister. And minister Lera's first task and priority is to uh, uh, set the date. Uh, we look forward to hosting it in Port Mosby because of logistic issues it's easier in Port Mosby. Uh, Bougainville Affairs Minister Joe Lera told MTV News he will work closely with the National Coordination Office of the Bougainville Affairs to ensure expectations are delivered concerning Bougainville matters. It will happen just before the next sitting of Parliament, which is on the 31st of next month. And Comba Director Joe Navira said the JSB is a positive direction and is looking forward to work with the new Bougainville Affairs Minister. They will have to come up with a date uh, specific before uh, we, we will start doing the administrative uh, arrangement for that to convene. The Prime Minister's direction comes after the JSB meeting in Kokopo last year was deferred and again this year after allegations of outstanding monies from the national government. Fabian Hakelitz. National MTV News. Newly sworn in State Minister Joe Lera is delighted the Bougainville Affairs Ministry has been given to the regional member who is elected and mandated by the people of Bougainville. This gives opportunity for regional representation in decision making 
and acts as a bridge between the national government and the autonomous Bougainville government. Ms. Alera said Bougainville needs a full representation in politics to address many issues of hindrance leading to the referendum. It is first term in politics, but already has proven his worth as Bougainville Regional MP in the national government. As an educationist, Joe Lera had been at the forefront of service delivery, touching lives of people in the autonomous region of Bougainville. When asked about his recent appointment, the new minister is determined to fulfill his role in the short time before the national election. It has come to the right time where now the Bougainville regional member as a minister as well can uh, rightfully become the center of Bougainville affairs and also become the mouthpiece of the total Bougainville population. His first priorities are to relook at the role of the Bougainville Affairs Office to be more responsible and visit fighting factions to take part in the peace process. These are complex issues because they deal specifically with people. Those will be the, my priorities and also to relook at the role of the Office of the Bougainville Affairs so that it's more responsive to addressing the issues on Bougainville, not in, in Mosque. The National Coordination Office of the Bougainville Affairs Director Joe Navira thanked the national government for the confidence in the appointment of the regional MP. Obviously, uh, Honourable Minister Lara has been working in Bougainville, so you, you, it's a positive uh, outlook uh, going forward. The new Bougainville Affairs Minister will meet with relevant authorities in the national and autonomous Bougainville governments to move forward. Fabian Hakelitz. National MTV News. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill also responded to questions on the merge of the, of the National Cultural Commission and the National Museum and Art Gallery. He said the newly appointed minister, Tobias Kulang, will meet with the former minister on management issues that need to be resolved. He added that the final outcome will be deliberated by the National Executive Council. Decisions that the Minister Tichenko has taken are decisions of government. Uh, not these personal decisions, and uh, they continue to uh, be rolled out as we speak. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are challenges there. The government has finally given the green light for Phase 1 construction of the Pacific Marine Industrial Zone in Medang to kick off. A commencement order was presented by Trade, Commerce and Industry Minister Richard Maru to the general contractor China Shenyang International Economic and Technical Cooperation Corporation Limited today in Port Moresby. The Chinese company will commence work by the end of this month. By end of this month, work on the controversial Pacific Marine Industrial Zone or PMIJ in Medang province will commence. The specifics of the construction is not clear, however it is believed Phase 1 will include construction of the wharf, sewage, roads and fuel storage and other physical structures necessary before investors move in. The Phase 1 construction is valued at 95 million US dollars or approximately 279 million kina. Uh, within the US uh, 95 million, I'd like to clarify that uh, it is an Exim Bank uh, concessional loan that was made available that uh, we were to utilize, but because of the delay, we were not able to draw down and the funds were no longer available, so we had to reapply through the Treasury uh, Department and the Minister to ensure that we protect that money and we ensure that we can now be able to draw down on that loan uh, funds. The money was funded by the China Export and Import Bank or the Exim Bank. The China Exim Bank funding represents 78% of the cost, with the remaining to be sourced from the PNG government through the Kumul Consolidated Holdings. On Monday, the government transferred the ownership of PMIJ to the Kumul Consolidated Holdings. Today, Minister Maru presented the commencement order to the Chinese contractor to start work on the phase one of the project. And this morning I will be on behalf of the government giving the, the formal 
commencement order to the contractor to start building the, the PMIZ in Medang. With defects and poor engineering discovered after the construction of the Lay Wharf Tidal Basin, Minister Maru now warned this contractor to be wise in engineering the PMIZ. There's a lot of concerns in government and our people about the quality of work being done by Chinese companies in this country. And obviously, many people have the view that the quality of work is not good enough. And we shouldn't be we should be looking for contracts for other countries. The challenge for you as a new contractor coming in is this project will make or break your company in terms of your brand in this country. It is up to you to make sure you work closely with KCH and deliver the the wolf and other aspects of this project to the highest standard in terms of building quality and finish. As the uh, general contractor, we will put all our strengths and uh, enthusiasm to make sure to deliver this project on time and uh, make this project with uh, high quality and function, benefits country and the local people. The PMIJ project was initiated in 2006 but was delayed through court proceedings and landowner disputes. During the delay, the initial loan approved by China Exim Bank was frozen but later opened in 2014. Minister Maru says the cost of the project will be higher than it was projected before. The PMIJ project will be the biggest fisheries hub in the country with 10 fish processing factories, a separate township and 30,000 employees. Construction work on phase one will start by end of this month. Quinten Alom, National MTV News. More than 30 doctors in Mount Hagen are now signing their resignation letters. All letters are now with the representative for the Highlands National Doctors Association, Dr. Benjamin Yapo. It was expected that all resignations were to be delivered to the CEO by 4 p.m. today. The doctors earlier petitioned the Mount Hagen Hospital Management on issues such as the focus on infrastructure development at the hospital instead of patient care. Among stories after the break, Manam Islanders call for participation in the resettlement exercise and the remote Western Province school that's getting ahead without government support. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Manam Islanders are waiting to celebrate with their Governor Jim Cuss when he meets them after his other official duties. This follows the passing of the MRA bill. Manam leaders, however, have called on the national, provincial and the district governments to work together and see the implementation of the resettlement process. They want the government to assure, ensure they are included in the infrastructural developments that follow after the resettlement exercise. Relieved and planning a celebration with the Medang Governor Jim Cass for having the MRA bill passed, are the Manam Islanders who have suffered for 12 years at the care centers. The Prime Minister and, and, and the full House of, of Parliament for passing the bill with uh, 91 votes to zero. And that's a, that's a good sign that uh, the government has, has eventually woken up to his co co commitment that uh, they've left us in this situation for far too long. The islanders hold on to both their traditional government of Kukurais, known as the Council of Chiefs, and the elected government. Peter Muriki, the Council of Chiefs Secretary, told MTV News that the people want to be included in the developments that will eventuate after they are resettled in Andarum. If it is true that there is going to be a huge budget for this you know, MRA starting 2017 and onwards, uh, we'd like to make sure that you know, everybody participates. Huh? And we are not voting members into parliament to serve their own interest. You know? We want them to you know, uh, look back at us and you know, see why originally they wanted us to put them in power. We want them to support us and, you know, make things happen. Muriki says the Council of Chiefs, as well as their leaders in the government, will go through the bill again to make sure the bill includes them. 
we will have our own, you know, meetings later on uh, to come up with, you know, uh, some resolutions. We want to study the MRA bill and make sure that we are in there and we are not outside. So we want to make sure that, you know, the people of Manam are fully benefited from this particular change. Rachel Shise, National Lamp TV News, Medang. Meanwhile, questions are in the air as to what happens to the people of Andaram in Bodia when they give away hectares of their customarily owned land to the Mana Islanders to resettle following the passing of the MRA bill. According to the Medan Governor Jim Cuss in an exclusive interview, the Manam bill is not only beneficial to the islanders and the Andaram people, it will benefit the whole Bogia district in terms of infrastructural developments. This also includes the host communities of the three current care centres. Rachel Shise with this report. 20,000 plus Manam Islanders will be resettled at Andarum in the Bogia district and the Medang Governor Jim Cass is thankful that the people of Andarum are open-minded in allowing the process. You survey also, you got maybe 2,000 people at Andarum or 5,000. Now, you also know that 20,000 Manams are coming. Uh, me like talk thank you long yupla long yupla one bell one time medan provincial government long ask him long yupla long synonym all manam long half long yupla na yupla talk yes according to governor Cass, the bill will see major development changes to Boge district as a whole including the three host communities at the current care centers and the medan province as a whole benefiting the bill i mean it is not small Mipla um, talk talk nothing long. Mipla say him nothing talk manam or talk, this la phrase manam igogona. A, a lot of us think that we are only trying to address the manam problem. No, it is something that is going to benefit the entire Bogia district. It's it's a it's the beginning of a growth center in Bogia, and it will also attract our partners from East Pacific. Governor Kass said groundworks for the resettlement process has already kicked off on hindsight without the hope of the Manam bill being passed this month. Without uh, having the confidence that we were going to pass the Manam bill, uh, Mila Komendi Medang Provincial Administrator and his team from uh, Ramu Development Foundation, in their wisdom and with my blessings, we moved 30 containers of, uh, of uh, prefabricated uh, prefabricated uh, housing materials to Holy Spirit. And as I'm speaking to you, the forward base is now being constructed. Rachel Shite, National MTV News, Medang. While schools throughout Papua New Guinea are well into Term 1, one school in remote western province is still yet to begin classes for 2016. Like the rest of PNG, Torasi Community School in the South Fly District has been badly affected by the recent drought and food shortages means children are not able to go to school yet. For the head teacher, while these are all new experiences for him, he's taking it all in his stride with the support of the community and the board of management. It was a Thursday when we visited the school. The classrooms and grounds are empty. Only the head teacher and board members are there to meet us. Head teacher Robin Hagume explains why. Still continue with this uh, uh, drought in now. Now yeah. food shortage now. We are in the food shortage. Because of that, uh, the Division of Education, Western Province, they advise us to just work in line with what the community thinks is best. Robin, an Eastern Highlander, became head teacher of the school last year when the Board of Management went on a recruitment drive so that their school can open. I was teaching in Mosby uh, and they went, they were looking for teachers. So like this part of the province, most of the local teachers from here, they don't want to come here because it's very isolated from uh, the rest of Western province. And it's very far and it's difficult to see other services. So the local teachers, they don't want to take up the post here. So they are running away. So it's very sorry for this community here. He's not able to bring his family here with him yet. But for someone who has lived in the city, and despite the challenges the school face, Robin likes it here. You know, life in the city is okay, but it's very hard, I mean, to survive. Also. He says in Port Mosby, money is always a constant worry. 
he has to try really hard to make ends meet. Here, despite not being on the government payroll yet, he is supported by the board members and the community. Apart from that, the school is located within the Tonda Wildlife Management Area, a place of beauty and tranquility. Tubai Mui, the school's board chairman, says the community will meet soon to discuss if they have enough resources for the school to open. We will be having our school work parade in here, and then uh, we will have be, we'll be also having our PNC and the board meetings together. That's when we will decide when the school will resume, and then we'll just let the education office know that we are resuming now. Sarah Aupong, National MTV News. More on that story on Talk Pixa on Sunday. Now, Northern Governor Gary Jufa has reassured church health workers in his province that the 15 million Kina budget cut to their salaries will not affect them. He said that the, that the Northern Provincial Government will provide funding to assist the workers. Opposition leader Don Pollier said that opposition members will be doing the same for their electorates. The cut is directed to the salary of the church health workers. He said the government needs to rethink the budget cuts on health church workers who provide services to the most remote areas of the country where public services cannot be found. Cut these services is, is completely inconsiderate and it is a complete slap in the face of our, the majority of our people who live in the rural areas. And I urge the government to reconsider. I urge them to not make these cuts but to continue to fund them. But Governor Jufa is reassuring health workers in his province that the provincial chairman for health has been tasked to find out how many health workers in the province will be affected by the budget cut and their provincial government will make funds available to those who are affected. Uh, the cost of um, you know, paying their salaries so that these cuts would not affect them you know, because they are out there serving the majority of our people, the majority of the people of Papua New Guinea live in the rural areas. This process will also be done by other opposition members in their electorates. Opposition leader Don Polier said the opposition will make sure their electorates are not affected. He said the government has 1 billion kina allocated as contingency in the budget under Division 207 and the government should be using the money for funding of church programs. We have not seen any audit or any accountability report put forward by the government of the Prime Minister. We know that such will happen again in the 2016 budget. No wonder they bulldozed it. I am calling on the Prime Minister to be transparent about it. One billion kina in Division 207 and spend it in health. Adelaide Sirox Kari National, MTV News. And now to our finance news. The kina closed at 0 0.3265 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, the kina was buying 0 0.3190 US dollars. 0.4242 Australian dollars, 0.2865 Euro and 35.90 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold and cocoa closed higher, while coffee and copper closed the day lower. Crude oil also closed lower, while palm oil and copper closed the day higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 67.18 points higher, the ASX closed at 33.12 points lower, and the All Ordinary is closed at 24.73 points higher. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Lay's Family and Sexual Violence Unit Officer in Charge, Sergeant Ruth Murup, has revealed that reported cases of family violence have increased in the last two years. Most of these cases had women and girls being the survivors. Some that came to lodge their complaints were men. She says Lay's FSVU records up to 40 family violence cases in every day. In 2014, it reports up to 70 cases of family and sexual violence in a month. This year, that number has ballooned to over 300 cases reported in a month. That's up to 40 various complainants reporting their cases in a day. The officer in charge here says the most commonly reported case is domestic violence, which results in assault charges. The most common one is uh, physical assault. Uh, where women get physically assaulted or even children or 
very few men report here that women also assault them, uh, married couples, but most of them are women. Sergeant Ruth Murup says some of the charges placed on perpetrators of various cases are insult, assault, threat, obscene language, threatening gestures or behaviors. She says in most cases, survivors only seek the FSVU for human rights counseling on their problems, but do not intend to pursue their matters further. So, this most of them, they come into lodge a complaint, but they don't end up in court. Most cases, they don't end up in court. They just come in, lodge the complaint. But what we do, normally do here is we register the complaint and we inform that if the perpetrator comes here, we only do two things here. We effect an arrest or we do an IPO for their protection. This police unit aims to provide legal support services for all survivors of gender-based violence, but the challenge has been on those in the rural communities where human rights information remains scarce. Colin Barilai, National MTV News, Lay. Lay City has seen a decline in major criminal activity since the start of this special operation. Lay Metropolitan Commander Anthony Wagambi said the decline comes from good police intelligence, investigations and coordination in locating and apprehending members of a known gang. Four members of the gang involved in major armed robberies were apprehended in the last two weeks. Wagambi said lay police are very experienced and are better coordinated. However, there is still room for more improvement. Lay police have caught one more prime suspect who was part of a known gang on Wednesday afternoon while he was traveling in a PMV bus. Police were monitoring the area and intercepted the bus at Eriku main bus stop and apprehended him. He is now in police custody. He will be arrested and charged and will be sent to Buimo Correctional Service. Another member of a gang was shot and killed while four others have been arrested and charged and sent to Buimo Correctional Service. These men have been arrested for a string of robberies throughout the city on major business houses. Police say these men have been linked to the robberies through CCTV footage and eyewitness accounts. That suspect is has been on the run for quite a while. He's been wanted for a string of robberies, very, very serious robberies and other crimes. Lay Metropolitan Commander Anthony Wagambi Jr. said Lay is a very operational area to work in when it comes to policing. Because of the large population and the lack of manpower and logistics, incidences happen often than expected. Wagambi said there is a need to implement the sector patrol in the city. The sector patrol will see the city divided into four zones backed with its own patrol unit and manpower. This will help police combat and prevent crime from happening. Wagambi said they have ambitious plans in place but will need the support from different stakeholders in Ley as well as the Morobe provincial government. Mata Luis, National and TV News, Ley. There are currently 5,200 outstanding bench warrants that need to be ex executed by police. Chief Justice Sir Salamo Injia said that these outstanding bench warrants add about 60% workload rather, to the pending criminal cases of the National and Supreme Court. However, National Capital District and Central Commander Sylvester Cloud says that the courts also need to increase bail amounts to hold guarantors liable. Callout commented that even though the courts have the power to grant bail on defendants, they must also put in place measures, especially on the conditions of bail for the guarantors, so that they must also be responsible. However, he said bench warrants are easy to grant, but it's difficult to re-arrest suspects. He said they are bombarded with new cases every day, and they won't commit resources again on suspects. They have been previously arrested and have been refused police bail. Kalaut further explained that since the suspects have been granted a court bail, it is now time the court increased bail on the affidavit of guarantors to at least 20,000 kina so that they will make sure the defendant attend the court cases. He said currently, guarantors get away with 500 to 1,500 kina bail guarantee. Meanwhile, 
Sir Salamo said the judiciary is in discussion with the Royal PNG Constabulary to improve in the execution of the bench warrant. Uh, and there still uh, remains at large to be executed by the police. And we are uh, engaged in discussions with the police hierarchy to improve on the execution of this bench warrant. A bench warrant is an arrest warrant that is ordered by a judge against the defendant in a criminal case or similar proceeding upon his or her failure to appear in court for more than once. Basenata Yama, National MTV News. Last year, the judiciary introduced the Fast Track Case, a procedure to promptly proceed pending cases of public interest at the National and Supreme Court. Such cases of public interest are election petitions and cases involving high-profile people which are managed by Chief Justice Sir Salamo Injia. Chief Justice Sir Salamo Injia is hopeful that these five petition cases will be completed in the coming months. He said there are also other cases of public interest that they expedited. Apart from that, measures have been taken to improve the dispensing of cases so that judges manage them efficiently. Uh, measures have been taken and uh, the issue of uh, backlog of cases are being addressed. And with the increase in the number of judges that we are getting nowadays, that is helping us to move cases along a lot faster than they were. Some years ago. Last year, Sir Salamo told MTV that there are more than 7,000 criminal cases that are still pending since 1983 because of irregularities in enforcement. Because of that, an integrated centralized database was established for all law and justice sector agencies that involved in the criminal justice processes to address such issues. Eleven memorandums of understandings were signed by the agencies that resulted in the launch of the National Criminal Justice Improvement Program. The early works to relocate all the temporary buildings in the Wagani Court Complex area are right in the middle. We are right in the middle. We are into what we call early works phase three and four, which will be the final. We've completed phase one which is the construction of the road access. A special track was also set up and is managed by the Deputy Chief Justice, Se Gib Salika, to assist in reducing the number of corruption fraud related cases. Se Salomo confirmed the cases have been moving faster. However, to assist, more judges are needed. That an ideal number of judges to really move cases a lot faster than uh, we are doing at the moment is uh, about 60 to 80 judges. Right now we've got uh, 40 or so. Basinata Yama, National MTV News. Turning overseas now, Nebraska Medicine, a medical center, has allowed an organ donor's mother to hear her son's heart beating inside another man's chest for the first time. Last week, Lisa Swanson and her son Shelby Schulz got the opportunity to meet Terry Hopper for the very first time, the man their relative's heart has saved. The donor was Levi Schulz, Swanson's 18-year-old son and Shelby's twin brother, who was involved in a car accident in 2012 and kept on life support in order to allow his organs to be donated. They got to listen to Levi's heartbeat inside Hopper's chest. Sad that my son's not here, but happy that he was able to help Terry. Nebraska Medicine told Reuters that Terry Hopper was put on the transplant list in October 2012 and received his new heart after a 52-day wait. The video also shows Swanson receiving a special gift from the medical center, a white teddy bear playing the recording of his son's heartbeat. You can listen to his heart all the time. Yep, every night. Vanessa Knight, MTV World News. And Trukai Sports is up next. Don't go away. Trukai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. 
In football, Tahiti has thrashed Fiji by six goals to one in the opening of the OFC Champions League in Auckland this afternoon. Tahiti's champion side A.S. Stefana dominated Fiji's Nandi FA with a small crowd watching. Coming in as heavy favourites prior to the game, Tefana wasted little time in attack as the Fijian side struggled to get any rhythm. Amassing 84 points from 21 games, Tefana were indeed heavy favourites heading into this match. Nandi were made to pay for some poor defending only 20 minutes in, as Temani Tenorua was given time and space. Slotting the ball easily behind goalkeeper Vretti Dixon. Tamari Tenorua has put Tefana one goal to the good. And a few minutes after that, Tefana were in again. This time, Tristanli Atani, who fainted on the edge of the box and scored with a left footed drive. Tefana double the lead on the half hour mark. That margin remaining until the second half, and by 48 minutes, Tefana had scored their third. 4 0 up seven minutes after that. When Tahiti Kek latched on to an easily placed cross. Oh, and that's a lovely goal. Just as he was saying it. The Fijian side really threatening and were only able to score through comical circumstances after Mikhail Roche directed the ball into his own net. Oh, dear me. It's an own goal. Mikhail Roche. But order was soon restored with minutes remaining as Noah Taverai finished off a swift move for a 6-1 victory. Tefano now lead the group after Magenta's 2-0 win over Kiwi FC with Nandi at the bottom of Group C. Jeremy Moggy, National, MTV Sports. Michael Marum had to make final changes to his starting team lineup ahead of their biggest clash yet against the Townsville Blackhawks at the National Football Stadium on Sunday. Hunter Prop Henry 1 won't be available for the match on Sunday due to personal reasons, and Marum has settled on having Prop Timothy Lomai included in the 17 man squad for his first match of the season. While it's not confirmed yet, Adam Korave may likely get the call-up to a starting role at lock and Brandy Peter be shifted with SLC Une up front. Marum has been working closely on defence during training and says the team will have to perform despite the immense pressure from the home crowd. Defensive uh, uh, season, uh, yeah, we, we worked hard. Okay, yeah, we we uh, uh, worked with the, uh, uh, the edges on our edge defense, on our edge there, but you know, uh, we, we train well here, yeah, but uh, the boys just need to uh, apply it in the game. So, I mean, understand pressure uh, in the game, and sometimes the boys forget it's really basic things. Justin Olam, who missed last weekend's match due to his graduation at the University of Technology, was surprised to be named in this weekend's team. I expect to be in the team. The boys played pretty well last time, and they come out win. But the coach and the management, they trusted me and gave me the position again, so I'll do my best this weekend. The previous home match against the Tweeted Seagulls kicked off late on a cool afternoon. This weekend's match will kick off at 3 p.m. Marum confirmed that the team's fitness is on par and playing at 3 p.m. will not exhaust the boys. Yeah, in a big game, we want to concentrate on uh, our training, uh, our preparations. And uh, yeah, but you now we're we excited about the game. We want to see them. Uh, here uh, Saturday, but you know, first of all, uh, I think our focus is just on training first there. Elijah Levent, National MTV Sports. Chuka Sports continues after the break. Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Trukai Sports. Now to a quick update at the Hong Kong Sevens. The PNG Pukpuk suffered an embarrassing defeat against an experienced Spanish team which showed pure class in the full 14 minutes. PNG lost 33-0. The annual Papua New Guinea Defence Force skill at arms meet was completed at the Goldie River Training Depot shooting range earlier this week. Based on individual performances, a 10-man train-on squad was selected at the end of the competition last Wednesday and announced by Force Preparation Commander-in-Chief Colonel Siala Diro at the closing on Wednesday evening. Man. The train-on team will go into months intensive training in preparation for the annual Australian Skill at Armsmith in Melbourne next month. 
Force Preparation Commander-in-Chief Colonel Siale Deros said this year's competition attracted teams from various units around the country. Our, ha our weapon handling and our accuracy at engaging targets is very important. Our soldiers, sailors, airmen and women must be able to deploy their weapon system in a manner that is accurate and that is safe. The participating teams were 1st Royal Pacific Islands Regiment, 1 RPIR from Taurama, 2 RPIR from Moem, Wiwak, the 4th Support Battalion, FSB, Murray Barracks, Air Transport Wing Division, HMAS Tarangau Naval Base in Manus, and Goldie River Training Depot. Every year, I'm competition, I'm improving okay, the ability of our soldiers. Eh? Now, the maximum skills, yes, I'm improving more now. Yeah. Whereby also meet again the scores and we've been determining uh, the selection of the team. The competition was tough and challenging, but competitors shoot it out to gain recognition from numerous selected sites and techniques. The Long Range Reconnaissance Unit was the top performing team on the range. Colonel Duro said shooting is an individual skill that is developed over time with constant practice and realistic training in order to perfect the art. You know, I'd like our people to know that our soldiers uh, are skilled and uh, in their hearts they want to serve our country and our people to the best of their ability. The shooters compete in range practice over two weeks, firing from different positions using different techniques in deliberate, rapid, snap and moving target practices from ranges of 100, 200 and 300 meters. The officers were supported by staff from the Goldie River Training Depot and notably by Warrant Officer Gary Iton from the Australian Defence Force. The 10 selected soldiers will participate in the Australian Army Skill at Arms meeting, focused at skill at arms combat that encompasses small arms system designed to allow for the assessment of all arms system capabilities, equipments and targetry, and training analysis of combat shooting techniques, weapon training doctrine and small arms practices. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. Preparation for the BSP 7 PNG Games are well underway. And host province governor Sassendran Muthavu said it is a great opportunity for West New Britain to showcase the province to the rest of the country. Amid speculation that games facilities may not be ready on time, Governor Muthavu is adamant that support will come from the national government for the biannual national games. Up to host one of the largest national sporting events the country has to offer, the PNG Games. The PNG Games attracts about 9,000 athletes from right around the country to compete in two weeks of intense competition in various sports. The economic opportunities for the province during the Games will be something that businesses in Kimbe can look forward to, along with the chance to showcase West New Britain to the rest of the country. Great opportunity for us to showcase uh, West New Britain and also the importance or uh, the amount of you know, tourism uh, interesting places within West New Britain. We have uh, bird watching, we have active uh, volcano, we have uh, beautiful diving spots and uh, there are many more, like we have uh, hot springs, like they can just go and experience it. With eight months to go, Governor Mutovel has assured the national government's support to the Games. Take it from me that uh, starting from Prime Minister to the, our uh, Sports Minister and Treasurer, Finance Minister, Planning Minister, they are all you know, uh, very uh, supportive of uh, you know, these PNG Games. Talent identified from the PNG Games have gone on to represent the country at competitions such as the Pacific Games and other Oceania sporting events and continues to be one of the most effective ways of sourcing talent from various provinces. Dion Kombang, National MTV Sports. In the midst of financial concerns for the host organizing committee for the PNG Games to be hosted in Kimbe, West New Britain, naming rights sponsor Bank South Pacific have announced a timely sponsorship of the biannual event. When comparing the previous games held in Ley, BSB Chief Executive Officer Robin Fleming said this was a fantastic event and eye-opener that allowed his company to come on board. When the governor asked me if BSP was prepared to assist with the sponsorship of the PNG Games, my biggest question was which governor, because we had governor from West New Britain, governor of Bank of PNG, too many governors. <laughs> but yeah, it was a great honour to be able to say that we will contribute as the naming rights sponsor to the BSP PNG Games. 
it is a significant contribution towards the overall sponsorship package. It is a fantastic opportunity for businesses in Kimby to be able to showcase what West New Britain culture and what West New Britain has to offer, not just international tourists, but local tourists. And I think that's what we really need to target. And that ends Truk Eye Sports. The weather details when we come back. Truk Eye Sports. Truk Eye Sports. Taking a look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region, fine although early morning fog inland for Port Moresby, mostly fine in Daru, Kerma and Alatau and fine in Popambeta. In the Momase region, evening showers for Lay City, a shower or two for Madang and fine in Wewak and Banimore. In the New Guinea Islands, fine for Lorengau, Kavian, Kokopo, Rabal and Kimbe and mostly fine in Buka. And lastly, in the Highlands region, evening showers, then morning fog for all centres. That's how we had National MTV News this Friday, the 8th of April, 2016. From all of us here at MTV, pleasant viewing. Good night.